This week's block of scripture that we are going to consider and study is 1 Corinthians chapters 8 to 13. I have divided it into two different blocks so that it's not so long in just one sitting. So this first part is 1 Corinthians chapter 8 through 10. 1 Corinthians 8, there are God's many and Lord's many. In 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 4, the Corinthians had asked Paul for counsel about eating meat as sacrificed by pagan people to their idols. He replies that, in theory, it is completely immaterial whether the saints eat such meat or not because idols are not true gods, and there's actually no religious significance to the pseudo-sacrifices one way or the other. But, he reasons in practice, it may be wise not to eat this meat, such, since such a course might cause those who are weak in the faith to assume there was virtue and benefit in the sacrifice themselves, and therefore be led astray. Sometimes we have to not do things that may affect others and how they perceive them, even though what we're doing is not wrong. But culturally or spiritually or whatever, they may, it may cause them to stumble. So even though it may be something may be right to do, doesn't mean you should necessarily do it. And praise God for such bursts of inspiration. In the midst of his relatively unimportant comments about some saints who had been partaking in pagan temples of food sacrificed to idols, Paul summarizes for his Corinthian brethren some of the great truths about the plurality of God. In 1 Corinthians 8, 5-6, the prophet Joseph Smith commented on Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 8, 5-6 about being Lord's many and God's many. Quoting, the prophet commented on this passage said, Paul had no allusion to the heathen gods. I have it from God, and get over it if you can. I have a witness of the Holy Ghost and a testimony that Paul had no allusion to the heathen gods in the text. That's from Joseph Smith. When Paul said there are Lord's many and God's many, he wasn't talking about the pagan gods having many gods. He was talking about there are Lord's many and God's many in celestial kingdom. The prophet, Joseph Smith, also taught in expanding John's statement, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, Revelation 1.6, that there is a God above the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. If Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and John discovered that God the Father of Jesus Christ had a Father, you may suppose that he had a Father also. Where was there ever a son without a father? And where was there ever a father without first being a son? When ever did a tree or anything spring into existence without a progenitor? And everything comes in this way. Paul says that which is earthly is in the likeness of that which is heavenly. Hence, if Jesus had a father, can we not believe that he had a father also? Indeed, this doctrine of plurality of gods is so comprehensive and glorious that it reaches out and embraces every exalted personage. Those who attain exaltation are gods. Go and read the version in the Book of Covenants, the prophet said. There is clearly illustrated glory upon glory, one glory of the sun, another glory of the moon, and a glory of the stars. And as one star different from another star in glory, even so do they of the celestial world different in glory, and every man who reigns in celestial glory is a god to his dominions. They who obtain a glorious resurrection from the dead are exalted far above principalities, powers, thrones, dominions, and angels, and are expressly declared to be heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, all having eternal power. I have always declared, this is continuing Joseph Smith, I have always declared God to be a distinct personage, 
Jesus Christ a separate and distinct personage from God the Father, and that the Holy Ghost was a distinct personage and a spirit. And these three constitute three distinct personages and three gods. Some say I do not interpret Paul's teachings of 1 Corinthians 8, 5 the same as they do. They say it means the heathen gods. Paul says there are gods many and lords many, and that makes a plurality of gods. I have a witness of the Holy Ghost and a testimony that Paul had no allusion to the heathen gods in the text. 1 Corinthians 8, 7-13 Paul's counsel about meat used in pagan sacrifices in Paul's day, some of the meat sold in the markets of Corinth and other cities had been butchered as offerings or dedications to pagan deities. Faithful Jews would have felt that the law of Moses prohibited them from taking of this meat. However, from Paul's words, it appears that some Christians did not feel restricted from eating it. See 1 Corinthians 8, 1 through 13, chapter 10, 14, and the 9, verses 19 through 33. For Paul, the greater concern was to avoid doing anything that might weaken the faith of others, unintentionally leading them into sin. 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 10, Neil A. Maxwell stated, Clearly, we are to help each other in the journey along the straight and narrow path. Even though such helping seems to drain us of energy and surely takes precious time, it actually strengthens us. We will become more like him whose followers we are. When we misbehave, however, we disappoint the weak, each other, and become a stumbling block. Paul was sensitive to this, but take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block to them that are weak. For if any man see that which hath, hath knowledge sit at meat in the, idol's temp, in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered unto idols? He was quoting 1 Corinthians 8, 9 through 10. What is it, in view of all the extra help and special grace we need, that God condescends to work through us individually as ourselves? God's love, but also his determination to use the weak, foolish, and despised of the world may have occurred because only such individuals are humble and palatable enough to perform his demanding chores. Perhaps God also desires to illustrate how he has the capacity to bring to pass his mighty and majestic purposes in the earth, even though he uses such individuals. Perhaps, too, God's continuous demonstration of his divine power is needed so that we will learn to trust him now in preparation for our ta tasks that are yet ahead of us, when we can be reminded of how he brought to pass his work on this planet, using the weak and foolish and the foolish and the despised. 1 Corinthians 9, 1 through 4. Am I not an apostle? Some apparently in Corinth had questioned Paul's claim to apostleship, such information having come to him either in their letter, which this epistle answers, or in verbal reports made by known persons. See 1 Corinthians 1.11. In eloquent terms, Paul replies that he is an apostle in very deed, for he has seen the Lord, that as such he is entitled to their support spiritually and temporally, that their very existence as a Corinthian congregation is proof of his apostleship, meaning that through his instrumentality they have been converted. But he says, as an apostle, he is still free, free to eat and drink, to work and preach, to plant and harvest, to marry and enjoy family associations, free to do all things for which he had apparently been criticized. The apostleship, there are two different types. Number one, an apostle is a special witness of the name of Christ who is sent to teach the principles of salvation to others. He is one who knows of the divinity of the Savior by personal revelation and who is appointed to bear testimony to the world of what the Lord has revealed to him. 
every elder in the church is or should be an apostle, that is, as a minister of the Lord and as a recipient of personal revelation from the Holy Ghost. Every elder has the call to bear witness of the truth on all proper occasions. Indeed, every member of the church should have apostolic insight and revelation and is under obligation to raise the warning voice. So apostle can be one who has a testimony of Jesus. In September of 1832, nearly two and a half years before there were any apostles ordained, ordained apostles in the church, the Lord said to certain missionaries, Ye are mine apostles, even God's high priests. That's Doctrine and Covenants 84, 63-64. In fact, Joseph Smith became an apostle in the spring of 1820 as a result of the first vision, even before priesthood was conferred upon him through the ministration of Peter, James, and John. And after the church was established, the Lord ordained, meaning decreed, that he continues to serve in this high apostolic station. Doctrine and Covenants 21 through 4, 21 verse 1 and section 27 verse 12 men are saved by giving heed to the words of the prophets and apostles sent among them and are damned for failure to heed their inspired testimony Doctrine from covenants 114 and as with nearly all things the devil offers us a, a spurious substitute to deceive men these are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ, 2 Corinthians 11.13. But faithful members of the church have the assurance that they shall sit in judgment, and liars and hypocrites shall be proved by them, and they who are not apostles and prophets shall be known. Doctrine and Covenants 64.37-39. A second definition of what an apostle is, in the ordained sense, an apostle is one who is ordained to the office of apostles in the Melchizedek priesthood. Ordinarily, those so ordained are also set apart as members of the council of the twelve and are given all the keys of the kingdom of God on earth. This apostleship carries the responsibility of proclaiming the gospel in all the world and also of administering the affairs of the church. Christ chose twelve whom, he, whom also he named apostles, and upon their shoulders the burden of the kingdom rested after he ascended to his Father. So that's one of the great distinctions of just a general apostle, meaning one who has a testimony of Jesus, and should declare that testimony versus one who's ordained and set apart in the council of the twelve and administers the affairs of the church. Only they have the right to administer the affairs of the church. 1 Corinthians 9, 5. Do not Barnabas and I have the same right to be married as do Peter and the other apostles and the brothers of the the Lord, occasionally Peter and other apostles apparently traveled with their wives. 1 Corinthians 9, 6-12 Paul and Barnabas, even as the other apostles have fed the saints spiritually, were entitled in turn to be fed temporally. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 9-11 If it is proper to let the ox that works in the harvest partake of corn, Surely men who learn, labor to harvest souls are also entitled to have their needs supplied. 1 Corinthians 9-12, through 12, if others be partakers. Paul is saying this shows that there are some persons receiving support from the Corinthian church. However, Paul has not used this power or right, that is, as the instrument of your conversion. Paul did, want, did not want to be accused of hindering the gospel by being suspected of self-interest. 1 Corinthians 9, 13-14 Live of the things of the temple, that is, its tithes and offerings. Who pays for the preaching of the gospel? Whence comes the money to pay for the transportation and for the food, clothing, and shelter of the missionaries? Must people pay to be taught the truth? 
or by their status and place in the kingdom. Two harmonious principles govern where preaching the gospel and cost of the kingdom are concerned. One, salvation is free, 2 Nephi 2.4. It has no price tag. It cannot be purchased with money. None has ever asked to buy saving grace. God decrees, decree is, every living soul is entitled to hear the truth and the testimony of Jesus born by a legal administrator who has no purpose in preaching except the eternal welfare of his hearers. To, pre, to all preachers, the Lord directive is, freely ye have received, freely give, Matthew 10, 8. Number two, but the minister of salvation must eat and drink. They must be clothed, married, great family, and live as other men do. When all of their time and strength is extending and building up the kingdom, others happily, those blessed by their ministrations, must supply the just needs and wants of the laborers in the vineyard, for the labor is worthy of his hire. DNC 8479. But the labor in Zion shall labor for Zion, and for if they labor for money, they shall perish. Second Nephi 2631. So those who are called to the ministry full time, that would be the, fir the first presidency and the quorum of the twelve, they do not still keep the regular charge, or I'm sorry, employment. They turn themselves completely over to the service of God, and then they are worthy of our help, which is given through tithes and offerings. 1 Corinthians 9, 15-16 In Paul's personal ministry, he took pride that these hands have ministered unto my necessities. Acts twenty thirty four. That is, that he had not been burdensome to the churches. 1 Corinthians 9, 16 Woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Paul was trying to say, unless God's ministers labor diligently, they are under condemnation. Those among them who serve God with all their heart, might, mind, and strength shall stand blameless before him at the last day. Doctrine and Covenants 4.2 Those who are slothful shall not be counted worthy to stand in his glorious presence and shall fail to gain the reward they offered to others through their preachings. Doctrine and Covenants 107, 99 through 100. 1 Corinthians 9, 17. Willing service is required. He that is compelled in all things, the same is slothful and not a wise servant. Wherefore, he receiveth no reward. Doctrine and Covenants 58, 26. Dispensation is used here to translate the word, Greek word meaning commission or stewardship. 1 Corinthians 9, 19-23 Paul adapted to the circumstances of each situation he came across and incorporated aspects of each people's culture to teach them. In the spirit of accommodation, but not compromise, Paul worked hard to establish common ground with those he taught and then least any suppose this included the acceptance of their false doctrines or practices, or that in any way involved a compromise between the gospel and false systems of, wor systems of worship, he hastened to add that he and all men must obey the gospel law to be saved. Our missionary approaches follow the same course today. To gain the interest of the learned, we reason and philosophize. To help the faith endowed Maori to see the light, we certify of the healing power that is in Christ. There is one approach in finding investigators among the Jews, another among the Buddhists, and still another among the sects of Christendom. But the final teaching is always the same. Accept Christ and the legal administrators who he has sent in this day and live the laws of the restored gospel. 1 Corinthians 19.20 Unto the Jews I became a Jew, meaning he claimed kinship with them, preached in their synagogues, quoted their prophets, showed how Christ fulfilled the law of Moses, and how the gospel grew naturally out of the foundation laid by their fathers. 
In certain circumstances, he submitted to Jewish laws and traditions. For instance, he circumcised Timothy, who was half a Jew, and he took himself and he himself took a Nazarite vow in the temple at Jerusalem, thus holding himself out as both a Jew and a Christian. Acts 21, 20 26. You need to understand that during this time, they're having this transition of all these converts, to, you know, they're Jew, Gentile, coming in and bringing all their different customs with them. Some that are harmless customs, others customs that go against the law of Christ and the teachings of Christ. And so Paul is trying to walk that fine line and show that sometimes doing some Jewish things was okay, so it did not offend them, but he was completely uh, made known that it was through the law of Christ that salvation is attained. In 1 Corinthians 9, 21, to them that are without law, Paul said, among the pagans at Lystra, he reasoned on the basis of natural religion, Acts 14, 8 through 18. On Mars Hill, he philosophized and quoted Greek literature, Acts 17, 22 through 31. And he refused to permit Titus, who was a Greek, to be circumcised, Galatians 2, 3 through 5. In 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27, self-discipline is essential to salvation. Even as athletes train for the races by being temperate in the use of food and drink and then run so as to win the victor's crown, so in the Christian race shall all those who control their bodies, who subdue the flesh to the spirit, and who run the race manfully, so shall they also receive an incorruptible crown. This goes along with, along with what Nephi said in 2 Nephi 31, 20 through 21. Wherefore you must press forward with the steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward, feasting upon the word of Christ, and endure to the end, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way. And there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. That is how we run the race. We press forward until the end, feasting upon the words of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, least I myself should, should be a castaway. Paul saying, least I be rejected of God and not gain salvation. For although a man may have many revelations and have power to do many mighty works, yet if he boasts in his own strength and sets at naught the counsels of God and follows after the dictates of his own will and carnal desires, he must fall and incur the vengeance of a just God upon him. Doctrine and Covenants 3, 4. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Who is the God of Israel? Is it the Father or the Son? In the Old Testament account, he is called the Lord Jehovah, the I Am, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Here, Paul teaches truly and clearly that Christ is the God of Israel, a basic and fundamental tr gospel truth which remains unknown and hidden to hosts of men in the sectarian world. According to God's revealed world, Elohim is the Father, Jehovah is the Son, and the Holy Ghost is their minister. Nephi prophesied that the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, would yield himself in the hands of sinful men to be crucified. 1 Nephi 7-17 And when the resurrected Lord ministered among the saints, he said, Come forth unto me, that you may thrust your hands into my side, and also that you may fill the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, 
and have been slain for the sins of the world. 3 Nephi 11, 14. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through fall. Paul pointed to ancient Israel as an example. Paul cited some of the experiences of ancient Israel to teach the Corinthian saints important lessons of discipleship. See 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 9. When Moses led the children of Israel out of Egypt, the Lord blessed them with numerous miracles. Nonetheless, many murmured, lusted after evil things, and committed serious sins. Paul admonished the Corinthian saints not to follow these poor examples. Elder Bruce R. McConkie commented on 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2, and explained the meaning of the phrase, baptized unto Moses. Elder McConkie said, Paul is saying that even as Israel, when they passed through the Red Sea, fled from the worldliness of Egypt, so their Christian descendants through baptism are to forsake the lust of the flesh and live godly lives. 1 Corinthians 10.3 Christ is the bread which came down from heaven, the bread of life, the spiritual manna of which men must eat to gain salvation. John 6, 31 through 58. He is the spiritual drink, the living water, the water of life, which if men drink, they shall never thirst. John 4, 6 through 15. He is the rock foundation upon which, upon which all men must build to gain an inheritance in his Father's kingdom. To eat of the bread and drink of the waters of life is to keep the commandments of God, which include, as the Corinthians here are being counseled, the forsaking of all that is carnal and evil. Christ is the rock. See Deuteronomy 32, 3-4, verse 18, and verses 30-31. The rock of heaven, Moses 7:53, which signifies his eternal strength and stability and holds him forth as the sure foundation upon which men must build their eternal homes. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 through 10. Paul here says ancient Israel rebelled against the Lord in the following particulars. One, in 1 Corinthians 10, 5, they rebelled in the wilderness against Jehovah, refusing to keep his statutes and judgments, for which they were destroyed and denied entrance into the promised land. See Ezekiel 20, 10 to 26. Number two, 1 Corinthians 10, 6. They lusted after the worldly things of Egypt, for which many were consumed by fire. See Numbers 11, 1 through 6. Some became idolaters, worshipped the idols of Egypt, and even sacrificed their children to Moloch, for which they were rejected and scattered. Ezekiel 20, verse 7, verse 18, and verse 29. Number 3, 1 Corinthians 10, 7, while Moses was on Mount Sinai, Israel enticed Aaron to make a golden calf to worship, which Aaron capitulated to. They reveled in pagan display of nakedness and lewdness before it, and they offered sacrifices to it, acclaiming the molten calf as their deliverer from Egypt, for which 3,000 were slain by the Levites with the sword. Exodus 32, 1-20. Number 4, 1 Corinthians 10, 8. They committed whoredoms with the daughters of Moab and made sacrifices to the pagan god Baal for which 24,000, Paul says 23,000, were slain by plague. Numbers 25, 1 through 9. Number 5, 1 Corinthians 10, 9. Because of the rebellion, many were bitten by the fiery flying serpents, which caused much people of Israel died. Numbers 21, 4 through 9. Number 6, 1 Corinthians 10, 10. Even after all Jehovah had done for Israel in the wilderness that showed his matchless power, great murmurings rose among against Moses, Aaron, and the Lord, for which God decreed that the carcasses of all those who were twenty years of age and upwards, save Caleb and Joshua, should fall in the wilderness, where their children also should wander for forty years. 
see Numbers 14, 1 through 38. Do you, do you see the pattern what he's trying to teach the Corinthians? Rebellion against God brings death. More importantly, spiritual death. It separates us from God. 1 Corinthians 10, 11 through 12. Having recorded this dreadful and despairing, despairing indictment, the apostle says plainly that all these rebellious rebellions were against the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the God of Israel. See 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Then says he, these things are not just dead history, they are living examples for us and for men of all ages, showing that when men rebel against God, they are cursed. And finally, he says, that none of them are subject to any temptations which are common to men. And if they will flee from idolatry, be wise, and keep the commandments, they shall be saved. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Paul recounted that many of the ancient Israelites gave into temptation as they wandered in the wilderness, despite the numerous blessings they received from God. Paul urged the Corinthian saints to take heed of the examples of those who fell to temptations. 1 Corinthians 10, 12. The Joseph Smith translation makes clear that Paul's admonition to the saints is also directed to us. Quoting the Joseph Smith translation, these things were written for our admonition also, and for an admonition for those upon whom the end of the world shall come. Paul also assured his readers that if they would rely on the Lord, they would not be tempted beyond their strength to endure. Compare 2 Peter 2.9 and Alma 13.28. Although God cannot always shield his people from wicked enticements, Paul promised that God would provide them with strength and a way to escape temptation. Sometimes I think we use this verse incorrectly in the church, thinking, well, I can go do what I want because God will not tempt me more than I'm able to bear. And so that I can given to temptation, but he'll stop me at a certain point. That is not what this is saying. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said, The justice, mercy, and love of God blend appropriately in providing us with adequate growth opportunities in this life. We will not be able to say shruggingly at judgment time, I was overcome by the world because I was overprogrammed or over-tempted. For the promises are that temptation can either be escaped or endured. 1 Corinthians 10.13 The promise is also that throughout tribulation, God's grace is sufficient for us. He will see us through. That is if we will remain faithful to Him. Grace is only accessed through by faith in Christ. Again, Neil A. Maxwell said, It is especially helpful to remember, therefore, that the temptations and challenges we face in mortality are common to man. Ye must respond uncommonly. Jesus responded uniquely through suffering, pains, and afflictions, and temptations of every kind. Alma 7.11 It is also useful to ponder the fact that along with even the Savior himself, we are to experience certain things according to the flesh, Alma 7.12, and as having the righteous in other times to learn in process of time, Moses 7.21. But therefore, in through the seemingly ordinary experiences of life, Elder Maxwell continues, are abundant opportunities for us to acquire the eternal attributes such as love, mercy, meekness, patience, submissiveness, and to develop and sharpen such skills as how to communicate, motivate, delegate, and manage our talents, time, and thoughts in accordance with eternal priorities. These attributes and skills are portable, are never obsolete. They will be much needed in the next world. What if we do not take the way to escape? Remember, Paul said that all temptations are common to man. And he will not let you be tempted more than you're able to today, but will provide an escape. 
What happens if you don't take the escape? Then we will be tempted more than we could endure in many lifetimes. Second Nephi 9.10 says, Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster. Yea, that monster, death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. Brothers and sisters, if we don't take the escape he's provided, we will be tempted more than we can bear. Alma 13, 28 through 29 says, But that ye would humble yourselves before the Lord, and call on his holy name, and watch and pray continually, that ye may not be tempted above which ye can bear. So there is one way he told us that we escape is through humility and, and service before the Lord, calling upon him. Back to Alma. And thus be led by the Holy Spirit, becoming humble, meek, submissive, patient, full of love, and all long-suffering, having faith on the Lord, having a hope that shall receive eternal life, having the love of God always in our hearts, that ye may be lifted up at the last day and enter into his rest. 3 Nephi 18, 18-19 says, Behold, verily, verily, I say unto you, you must watch and pray always, lest ye enter into temptation. For Satan desireth to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. Therefore you must always pray unto the Father in my name. So there is another aspect to the escape. What is the escape? It is best summed up in 2 Nephi 31, verses 2 through 21. I know this is long, but this is critical. Nephi says, Wherefore, the things which I have written sufficeth me, save it be a few words which I must speak concerning the doctrine of Christ. That is our escape from being tempted more than we can bear, brothers and sisters, is the doctrine of Christ, which is, Wherefore, I speak unto you plainly, according to the plainness of my prophesying. For my soul delighteth in plainness. For after this manner that the Lord God work among the children of men. For the Lord God giveth light unto the understanding. For he speaketh unto men according to their language, unto their understanding. Wherefore, I would that ye should remember that I have spoken unto you concerning that prophet which the Lord showed unto me, that should baptize the Lamb of God, which should take away the sins of the world. And now with the Lamb of God being holy, should have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness. Oh, then how much more need have we, being unholy, to be baptized, yea, even by water? And now I would ask of you, my brother, beloved brethren, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness and being baptized by water. Know ye not that he was holy, but notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove. And again it showeth unto the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which they should enter, he having set the example before them. And he said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, can we follow Jesus, save we shall be willing to keep the commandments of the Father? And the Father said, Repent ye, repent ye, and be baptized in the name of my beloved Son. And also the voice of the Son come unto me, saying, He that is baptized in my name, to him will the Father give the Holy Ghost, like unto me. Wherefore, follow me, and do the things which ye have seen me do. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, I know that if ye shall follow the Son, with full purpose of heart, acting no hypocrisy, and no deception before God, but with real intent, repenting of your sins, witnessing unto the Father that you are willing to take upon you the name of Christ by baptism, yea, by following your Lord and your Savior down into the water, according to his word, behold, then ye shall receive the Holy Ghost. Yea, then cometh the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost, 
and then he can speak with the tongue of angels and shout praises unto the Holy One of Israel. Behold, my beloved brethren, thus came the voice of the Son unto me, saying, After ye have repented of your sins and witnessed unto the Father that ye are willing to keep my commandments by the baptism of water and have received the baptism of fire and of the Holy Ghost and can speak with a new tongue, yea, even with the tongue of angels, and after this should deny me, it would have been better for you that you had not known me. And I heard a voice from the Father saying, Yea, the words of my beloved are true and faithful. He that endureth the end, the same shall be saved. And now, my beloved brethren, I know by this that unless a man shall endure to the end, in following the example of the Son of the living God, he cannot be saved. Wherefore, do the things which I have told you, I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. For for this cause have they been shown unto me, that you might know the gate by which ye should enter. For the gate by which ye should enter is repentance and baptism by water. And then cometh the remission of your sins by the fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then are ye in this straight and narrow path which leads to eternal life. Yea, ye have entered in by the gate. Ye have done according to the commandments of the Father and the Son. And ye have received the Holy Ghost, which witnesses of the Father and the Son unto the fulfilling of the promise which he hath made, that if ye enter in by the way, ye should receive. And now, my beloved brethren, after ye have gotten into this straight and narrow path, I would ask if all is done. Behold, I say unto you, Nay, for ye have not come this far, save it were by the word of Christ, with unshaken faith in him, relying wholly upon the merits of him who is mighty to save. Wherefore, ye must press forward with a steadfastness in Christ, having a perfect brightness of hope and a love of God and of all men. Wherefore, if ye shall press forward feasting upon the word of Christ and endure to the hand, behold, thus saith the Father, ye shall have eternal life. And now behold, my beloved brethren, this is the way, and there is none other way nor name given under heaven whereby man can be saved in the kingdom of God. And now behold, this is the doctrine of Christ and the only and true doctrine of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, which is one God without end. Amen. So what is our escape? Jesus Christ is our only escape from the natural man and temptation and the evils of this world. And the only way to come unto Christ is through baptism, Holy Ghost, enduring to the end, and keeping the commandments and doing the things which Jesus Christ has done. If you do not take that escape, I promise you will be tempted more than you can bear. President Henry B. Eyring taught that we can pray for help as we face temptation. With the help of the Holy Ghost, we can watch over ourselves. We can pray to recognize and reject the first thoughts of sin. And we can, when we must, pray for humility and the faith to repent. There will surely be some who hear my voice who will have this thought come into their minds. But the temptations are too great for me. I have resisted as long as I can. For me, the commandments are too hard. The standard is too high. This is not so. The Savior is our advocate with the Father. He knows our weaknesses. He knows how to succor those who are tempted. You just have to turn your life over to him. That was my saying, not part of Henry Bion. 1 Corinthians 10, 16-21, the cup and the bread of communion. Paul spoke of church members eating and drinking together as partakers of that one bread. 1 Corinthians 10, 16-17, in the culture of the ancient Near East, dining together at the same table was an expression of unity, peace, and friendship. If there had been problems or disagreements among individuals before they sat down to eat, these were resolved and all parties were reconciled. Paul reminded the saints of this idea when he spoke of the sacraments, which he referred to as communion. 
The word translated as communion in 1 Corinthians 10.16 denotes close fellowship, partnership, and sharing. Therefore, when members partake of one bread loaf during the ordinance of the sacrament, they affirm oneness or unity not only with Christ but also with one another. 1 Corinthians 10.17 They are partakers of the Lord's table. 1 Corinthians 10.21 and have the opportunity to be reconciled with Christ and enjoy greater communion with Him. A gold wreath crowned from Cyprus, 3rd or 4th century BC, Paul noted that Greco Roman athletes raced for the price of a crown that would perish, but followers of Jesus Christ strive for self mastery to win the crown of eternal life. See 1 Corinthians 9 24 to 25. 1 Corinthians 10.22 Do not provoke the Lord to jealousy by dividing an allegiance. Are we stronger than he? This was really what the conduct of those who frequented idol feasts amounted to, a challenge to God. How absurd their conduct when thus analyzed. Do you really think you're going to win if you're going to challenge God? and try to straddle the line between the world and the gospel, and try to live in both of them. Practical directions. Paul has shown the moral danger of joining in what was about a sacrificial, idolatrous feast. He now comes to cases where it was lawful to eat meat that had been offered in sacrifice to idols, provided the feelings of others were considered. 1 Corinthians 10:23-24. In dealing with the limits within which Christian liberty may be exercised, we have to consider not merely whether a thing is permissible, but whether it is helpful to others as well as to ourselves. As I said earlier, something may be okay to do, but that doesn't mean it's okay to do it if it may harm others that are maybe lower in the gospel and don't have a complete understanding. 1 Corinthians 10, 25-33, verses 25 and 26, Paul says, You may freely eat without asking questions any meat you buy in the market, for all that is in the world is from God, and therefore good. Verse 27, And if you go to a feast at a friend's house, eat without questioning whether it is placed before you. Verses 28 and 29, But if told that anything has been offered in sacrifice, abstain from it so as not to withhold the conscience of your informant. You must take a stand. Do not condone idol worship in any way. Verses 29 and 30. Remember, it is entirely for his sake that you abstain, for in the abstract it is not well that another's conscience should be scandalized by the liberty I exercise, or that what I receive as God's good gift should cause me to be maligned. Verse 31, so not only eat and drink, but do everything to God's glory. Verse 32, and avoid giving offense to men, whether Jew or heathen or fellow Christians. Verse 33, everything, verse 33, remember that I always seek to deny myself for others with a view of their profit and salvation. 11.1, 1 Corinthians Follow my example in this respect as I follow Christ. Paul has been asked, should the saints eat things sacrificed to idols? Since the sacrifice have no standing for God, what does it matter if members of the church eat of them? How powerfully he reasons in reply. First, he reminds the Corinthians that they have a true ordinance, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, through which they all may become one. Through it, they all may receive the guidance and companionship of the Holy Spirit. And by communion with this Spirit, they are made one in Christ and thus gain salvation. Then he speaks of false ordinances which lead not to salvation, but to damnation. Not to God, but to Lucifer. Since a sacrifice to an idol is not of God, whence is it? He answered, it is a sacrifice to devils. 1 Corinthians 10.20 Therefore, they should not partake and have fellowship with devils. In effect, he is asking, since false ordinances are not of God, whence are they? 
If, for instance, the saints have a true ordinance of the sacrament, which comes from God, and false churches have false ordinances of the sacrament, whence come these false ordinances? His argument is the same in principle as that is used by the prophet Joseph Smith in contrasting the true sacrifice of Abel and the false sacrifice of Cain. Cain could not, could Cain could have no faith, the prophet reasoned, because a false ordinance is contrary to the will of God and is not possible to exercise faith contrary to the plan of heaven. So what Cain offered up was a false ordinance. It was not, the, the commandment was to offer the firstling of the flocks that Abel abided, and that's why God accepted Abel's sacrifice. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the presentation, hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel.